waiting on my partner. We had a slight wardrobe malfunction. I apologize. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, God, both of us are so excited to, to be here to share some thoughts with you. And uh, I want to thank Aaron for making this possible. And it, it's an honor to be with you, to be in this convening, and uh, to hear from Rip Rapson. Um, and to hear specifically about what I think we're all here to support, and that is uh, the arts and our collective work towards a society where all people in all our diversity can thrive. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to talk with you today. Thank you. And um, as, as I was thinking about this conversation, I started thinking about my own experience as uh, someone who's worked in the urban planning field and public policy and has dedicated most of my career now to the role of the arts in communities and particularly in disadvantaged communities. And I've often been asked um, if you care about low-income communities, communities that have been historically marginalized, why are you doing this art stuff? <laughs> and the connection between uh, the arts and what we think of as an equitable and just society isn't always apparent or easily apparent. Uh, and in my own thinking, when people have asked me that, my response has been that if we don't tend to our generative lives, uh, to our creative, aesthetic, and intellectual development as humans, to our ability to be compassionate and empathetic and thoughtful, then any strategy that seeks to improve a community uh, without consideration for that is critically flawed. And I think I've seen a lot of evidence of that in the work that the Kresge Foundation has been doing, uh, particularly as part of its arts and culture program. And I'm eager to hear Rip's perspective as the architect of all of this. Why, why take that approach? And why take that approach now? And as I hear Maria frame the question, I'm sort of reminded that when you don't have charisma, you bring it along with you. And so thank you, Maria, for coming along. <laughs> Um, I think in many ways she's stated the proposition exactly right, is that it's very difficult for an uh, organization like Kresge to think about the future of American cities, and particularly the role of low-income opportunity in American cities, when you sort of slice off the arts and push them to the side, which is, I think, what so often happens in policy debates, in political conversations, and, and often in the sort of the, the ebb and the flow of, of daily life. And I think one of the reasons that we in Kresge feel so strongly about the role of arts um, in our portfolio is that we believe that it is every bit as essential to have arts and culture at the table having these kinds of generative, reflective, um, sensitive conversations about the future of a community as it is to have people from the realm of transportation or from housing or from health or from human services. And so our fundamental proposition is that arts and culture needs to be at the core of every conversation we have about community development in our country. Uh, and uh, I, I think that what, what ends up happening when that happens is exactly what Maria has just described. The conversations are richer, they're more balanced, they have much more to do with the creative potential of inviting people in to examine not only their potential for human development, but also the potential that arts and culture have to drive economic development, to drive sensitive placemaking, to drive um, the kind of long-term visioning that a community needs in order to remain vital and healthy. And the minute you drive arts and culture into a conversation, I would argue, it sort of begins to reflect back up the true nature of a community with all of the richness and, and the diversity that it includes. So for us, it's actually a very straightforward proposition that you simply can't engage in the kind of community reimagination, the community health, and the community revitalization that our disinvested areas in America need to have without putting at the core arts and culture. And why now? 
why is now the particular moment when that's, that's a answer. smart thing to do or well, the right thing to do? Maybe two answers, I mean, if, if I can. I mean, one is sort of a, a Kresge answer. I mean, why would Kresge do this now? And I think there is the sort of the more interesting question of why might that be appropriate now in, in America in, in sort of the current state of affairs. Let me take the, the easy one first. Kresge, um, a year or so ago, uh, concluded that the only way that we could really create the kind of coherence and the kind of impact we sought was if we aligned our work around the North Star of low-income opportunity in America's cities. Uh, it's a broad concept to be sure, but when you think about it, it excludes a lot of things as well. And so when you think about human services, it seems fairly straightforward that you're trying to address issues of low-income opportunity. When you think about uh, often health disparities, when you think about um, uh, community development imperatives, sometimes those things are sort of front and center. But our arts program actually was much more about arts capitalization structure. You know, are, are the arts overcapitalized? Are, uh, are they doing the right things to position themselves for the future? And I think we realized that just as all of our other programs had to sort of zoom in on low-income opportunity, so did the arts. And so our whole program is really about how do you create opportunity in America's cities through arts, through the cultural activities of a community. So in our own evolution, it's kind of why we got there. But I think probably the more profound reason is I think that when you're dealing with the kind of intractable, gnarly problems that our society is dealing with now, racial disparities, income disparities, um, lack of upward mobility, all of the sort of the things that I think tear us apart every day as a society, I just have increasingly come to the view, and I think our entire team has increasingly come to the view that arts simply has to be at the center of that conversation, that you can't infuse those conversations and those processes with the kind of creativity, the kind of energy, the kind of uh, identity perspective that you need in order to make real progress. And I think we can try, but I think that we've tried for a long time by pushing arts to the side. And I think it's, it's probably well past time that the arts stopped looking in from the outside mm -hmm. and got into the inside and began helping shape shape from the inside out. Yeah. That's um, <laughs> That's a terrific way to envision things. Um, creative placemaking, which I'm sure many people have heard the term, is a very central part of the arts and culture strategy at the Kresge Foundation. Can you talk a little bit about what it is and how Kresge defines it? and also how it connects to this notion of equity and diversity. Um, you know, in the, um, in the community development field, uh, the, uh, the whole idea of placemaking has been around for a long time. It, it just, it, it pivots on the idea that uh, places are important. It's, uh, places are the places that define us, um, that you attach to a place with a sort of an emotional energy and a sense of long-term commitment often that is really definitional to how a community works, to how individual identity is formed, to how group identity is formed. And I, m my sense is that in many ways, creative placemaking is just sort of an extension of what I just talked about, which is I don't know how you do placemaking without the infusion of arts and culture into that process. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of work with traditional community development over my career and I can tell you that every conversation I enter, um, it, it is a unnatural act to put creative placemaking in the middle of the conversation as a taxonomy, as a, as a topic. People say, well, we'll get to that later, or, you know, yeah, arts and culture are, are fine, but, you know, we've got to really focus on the real issues of low-income housing or low-income job opportunity or whatever it is. And I, I think the, the idea of creative placemaking is, again, just this simple construct that as we think about arts and culture, it has to be critical to how we define the places that we want, the places that we have, the places that we want in the future. How do we tie back to our received history? How do we tie back to the legacies of a community? How do you project that forward? I don't know, frankly, how you have that conversation that so often gets sort of technical and technocratic without the kind of the, again, the energy and the insight and the sort of quality of sort of looking around the corner 
and um, that, that arts and culture often bring. So for me, creative placemaking is just the, the proposition that you have to inject issues of arts and culture, processes of arts and culture, uh, the sensibilities of arts and culture into community dialogue about its future. One of the things that's gotten my attention about the work at Kresge and, and the focus on building on local assets mm -hmm. and arts and cultural assets uh, specifically as, as part of this strategy is that it takes a posture that everyone has something to deliver, hmm. that people um, have the obligation and capacity to help create the places where they live and that through their own creativity and as aesthetic expression, uh, it's, an important, it's an important form of civic engagement, really. Uh, and that's always gotten uh, my attention. As you see the creative placemaking field growing, and there are more and more uh, examples of it around the country for, for lots of reasons, what gives you confidence that, that this is the right, the right investment, this is the right thing to support? Um, I think it, two or three things. I mean, yeah. one is that there's just so much of it. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was trying to prepare for a, a talk I had to give in Minneapolis um, a number of weeks back um, about the role of historic theaters. And so the historic theater community wanted me to talk about how important it was to sort of have these anchors of a community be almost acupuncture points that radiated out energy into the community. And I, as I pushed the audience a little bit, I said, it's fine to have a physical structure always drive that, but think of all of the different ways that arts and cultural activity push a community's conversation in different directions. And we just sort of canvassed around the room, and we came up with um, examples from the performing arts, examples from the visual arts, examples from sort of classic community organizing, things that weren't always sort of rooted in the sort of the, the bricks and the mortar of what the theater community sort of had in mind. And I think one of the things that makes me have a, a much more confidence that this is a construct that is actually there and simply hasn't been fully appreciated and fully captured is the extraordinary variety of community experience that we're seeing that plays this out. I was thinking, for example, that um, in Minneapolis, we were in downtown Minneapolis, and um, that morning I had taken the new light rail line that's running between Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's a billion dollar new public works project moving between the two, two downtowns. And a project called Irrigate has sort of taken this opportunity to figure out how along entire stretches of this line that are populated by newly arrived Hispanics, newly arrived Eastern Africans, newly uh, arrived Hmong folks, um, how you can make this line essentially reinforcing of community culture rather than destructive of community culture. So they did a lot of the things that you might expect. They did uh, uh, ways of livening up the stops. They thought about ways of uh, doing sort of performance art to call attention to the, to the new line, but they also worked very carefully with the small businesses all up and down the line to try to figure out how they could figure out ways to reinforce identity, reinforce culture, as well as to stabilize the business. And as a result, I think what's happened along this line is a whole series of opportunities to create sort of long-term presence of the arts in what has, would have otherwise been a very traditional public works project. Um, and I, and I, just, I think that that's the kind of thing that we're seeing just time and time again all over the country. So that's, that's one reason. A second reason um, is that we have just created in philanthropy, sorry to be sort of inward looking, but we've just created in philanthropy something called Art Place. Art Place is a consortium of 10 or 12 of the largest foundations in the country, including Ford and Kresge and Knight and, and others, to elevate the concept of art place being a, uh, of creative placemaking being sort of this first principle in community development. And I've been surprised at how quickly philanthropy has sort of come to this view, and including some fairly traditional fun funders. I think of some, someone like the Mellon Foundation, which has that fairly traditional funding pattern, as you probably know, into well-established, long-established arts institutions. And this notion of community-based placemaking animating their portfolio was actually quite exciting to them. Yeah. So I think that's a, a second piece. And I think the third piece is that at the end of the day, 
Creative placemaking is inherently an interdisciplinary act. You can't put arts and culture into the middle of this fence line that I described earlier and not have it bump up against ricochet influence all of the other public and private and nonprofit and philanthropic systems, systems in the fence line. We've got to figure out, as arts and cultural workers, how do we deal with the private sector? How do you deal with the public sector? How do you have a conversation with the transportation department? How do you have a conversation with the community development movement and the affordable housing movement? And I think that's happening more and more and more. I, I've been particularly uh, encouraged, for example, by the National Endowment for the Arts and, and the Obama administration. I don't mean to be political about it, but the Obama administration sort of embrace of having arts in all of these conversations. Sean Donovan, the Secretary of HUD, is deeply committed to making sure that in every RFP they send out, there is a arts and cultural component. I think they can do better in terms of how they write the regs and how they distribute their money, but I think it's an enormous first step that's been completely absent from federal policy for 50 years. Yeah. As you were talking about Irrigate and, uh, and some of the activity evident in Art Place, uh, I'm thinking about also the role of artists. Hmm and how uh, artists uh, continually emerge as leaders. Hmm. I mean, often we think about artists as either people who are just on stage or uh, to deliver a show or uh, do a concert, or we think about people who are making things to be sold or consumed hmm. somehow, and those are important roles, but there's so much evidence of artists taking other kinds of roles in relation to community and place. Um, as helping people to be stewards of their own creativity, um, helping people to be visionary and themselves being visionary. Uh, and that's just very exciting. Oh yeah, I mean, think of Theaster Gates. I mean, the work that yeah. he's done in Omaha and St. Louis and Chicago. I mean, here is someone who not only is a, an artist of sort of the first rank in his own right, but he is extraordinary at sort of pulling together design professions, community organizing, all of the kind of building blocks of community. and. He has emerged as a community development leader. I, I think of uh, our own examples here. I saw Rick Sperling come in from Mosaic Theater. I mean, Rick every day is defining the way community life in Southwest um, Detroit works. Or, of course, uh, Tyree Guyton at, at Heidelberg. I mean, these are the folks who are in, you know, inseparable from their fabric. And I think that increasingly, as artists become more and more immersed in their communities, they inevitably become leaders because they are creative, they're smart, they're visionary, and they're inspirational. And not everybody, but lots. And, and I think that that's in short supply. I think that kind of visionary, aspirational leadership is something that artists bring to the table in, in disproportionate numbers. And, and although it's in short supply, I think it's really encouraging to see more and more evidence of uh, artists and the arts not just as icing on the cake, hmm. but as baked into the batter. Hmm. Uh, and it's exciting to see what happens, you know, how are issues framed differently or problems formulated differently when you have a different kind of perspective at the table, uh, which is a different role for artists. It's, it's not the, the mural at the end of the project or the concert uh, only to celebrate the opening of a place but a really fundamental investment in and co-creation of these strategies and, and places that are so important to uh, diversity and, and equity. Well, because we're in Detroit, I mean, I can't, I can't help but take the opportunity. I mean, we, we have spent for the last three or four years developing something called the Detroit Future City Plan, which is a plan that tries to think about the long-term ways in which we can take so much of Detroit's underutilized and abandoned and neglected land and push it over the ledger into productive use. And, um, you know, spoiler alert, guess who's on the front edge of all of that? I mean, it is absolutely the arts and cultural community. It is uh, individual artists, it's arts organizations, it's coalitions of artists, whether it's reclaiming an abandoned house for a theater, whether it's uh, Tyree doing Heidelberg and trying to stem the tide of, uh, of abandonment in his community, whether it's um, any number of sort of opportunities that we haven't even begun to think. But when you think about, us, in Detroit, we have uh, an abandoned set of properties the size of the city of San Francisco. I mean, we essentially have that much square mileage in abandonment. 
And when you think about the creative reuse possibilities, it seems to me that my A team is the arts and cultural community. I want economic developers, I want environmental ecologists, I want transportation specialists, but I really want people who can think in ways that all of those folks sometimes struggle to think in. And that's exactly what's happening. I think that this has become just this enormous canvas of creativity um, for um, folks from all across the country as well as from uh, for folks who have been here a long time. And, and we have a vibrant, active arts community who I think is really gonna help put Detroit back on the map in terms of sort of changing the image people have of what it means to have a land that is perhaps underutilized and has been converted into very exciting different kind of space. It sounds like what we're, we're after is uh, a sustained integration of arts and culture mm -hmm. in, into how we think about healthy places to live and places where uh, everyone uh, can thrive. Um, and the question that, that, that still remains though is what will it take for that to be a reality? Hmm. What does it take for an urban planner to wake up and think, oh yes, I have to go consult with artists or to uh, have a developer think about a neighborhood, uh, an African American neighborhood or a Latino neighborhood and hmm. think there are cultural assets here that I must build from. What does that take? Huh. Um, one thing I think it takes is uh, proof patterns. I think we just need to really hold up where this is working because it, I just think it's working more and more and more. And I, I think that we've got to figure out whether there aren't platforms that are sort of readily sort of digestible that just let people know that's going on and that these are possibilities. Two, seems that people who sit in chairs like mine who have the ability to fund things um, ought to start funding things that make a difference. And uh, not that we don't, we do, but uh, <laughs> sorry, board of directors. But I, I, think, um, I think there is an opportunity for some creative um, investment on the part of folks who control some discretionary Money, and I think that's what's so promising about Art Place. And, um, and I, I think at the end of the day, it's sort of a top-down meets bottom-up proposition um, because as many, many proof points as we can get from the community, as much as the sort of mezzo level of funders can be helpful, I think every time you get a Sean Donovan and HUD or someone at the national level, Rocco Landisman was spectacular at the endowment, I think those folks sort of pushing down, and then I think the tension zone in the middle becomes really interesting, and I think you potentially change the vocabulary, you begin to change the public perception of the role of the arts, and I think then that helps sort of reinforce all of the activity that is already underway. I don't think we have to invent this, we can't. It's already there, it's underway, but I think it's sometimes undervalued, sometimes under-recognized, and almost always underfunded. So I, I think also, um the systems that are in place, you know, when we talk about HUD, we talk about NEA, we can talk about Department of Transportation or Education mm -hmm. environment, um, and it's mirrored at different levels. They were built in silos uh, and work very internally, and I think the call in creative placemaking is to bust the silos mm -hmm. and introduce <laughs> the arts in ways that people haven't thought about the arts before, uh, and I think Inherent in that is some risk taking um, on, on all parts. Uh, and I think that's a critical element of, of uh, what will be required to see it sustained and for the proof patterns, the ability to take some risks. You know, I, we can't see you because of the lights, but I, I think if we could, I, I, I've got to believe that there are people who are saying, you know, fine, you know, interdisciplinary work you know, cross-sectoral work, all of that's really important, but I've got a day job, and it's really hard to get done. And, you know, if you're asking me to sort of reach out or sort of become more porous in, in sort of the way my, my fence line works, it's asking a lot, and I think, I think that is true. Um, I remember when I, I, I ran the McKnight Foundation in Minneapolis before I came to Kresge, and we have one of, the, McKnight had one of the great, um, cultural program officers in the country, Neil Cuthbert. And I talked for, the, for a moment um, with Neil at one point about why don't we have a sort of a statewide convening of 
arts organizations so that not only do they talk one to another, which actually wasn't happening this decade ago, but why don't we invite in other kind of community practitioners? And Neil, who is as smart as anybody in the field and as thoughtful and as committed as anyone in the field, just shook his head and said, Rip, it's never gonna happen. You know, it's, it, people are too busy, it's too hard to think outside your own systems, uh, and unless there are constructive incentives for people to do it, it's not gonna happen. Well, I think part of the incentive is just a problem-solving incentive. I just think that you um, can never fully, well, you can never fully solve most any problem, but you can't fully engage a problem until you really do pull these pieces together. Um, and I think part of it is, uh, in some ways, and I think Neil might give me a different answer today, I think in part ways, it's, a, but it's also a failure of imagination. If you think about your job as not, if you think about working in an interdisciplinary, cross-boundary way as above and beyond your job, I would submit that maybe you ought to take another look at your job description. Because I think increasingly, um, it is a part of your job description. We just cannot work in these silos. It's just, it, it, the, compl the complexity of our problems, the, um, the fluidity of, of change um, in our communities is just sort of busting down those walls for us. And I think that most uh, cultural organizations see that and, and are trying in their own way to become such much more adaptable, much more resilient, and that requires, I think, that you reach out and, and move things around a little bit. So we have a few minutes, and we should open this up to, to the audience for comments, questions, thoughts. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I think there, there are two people with mics, right? Robin Hickman from Minnesota. We're missing you, man. Oh, <laughs> missing Hi. you. Just, just again, thank you. I, the first, this opening session has touched my soul. I just thank you all. I just want to say that. Meet you in the networking room. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hi, um, Roberto Bedoya from Tucson. So, oh. really happy to be here. Um, want to give props to Muddy who worked on a project with us that was funded by Kresge, the Place Initiative. Yeah. So, um, which is a civic engagement thing. So can you talk a look about how the politics of disbelonging operate yeah. in, in your frame? I mean, obviously from Arizona where we have toxic politics yeah. and a lot of disbelonging, how does that intersect with your notions about placemaking? Yeah. That's a, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, My sense is that one of the great values of uh, community-based creative placemaking is it is community-based. And as much as uh, toxic politics wants to try to rip the ownership of your own community from you, at the end of the day, it simply can't. It, um, I think that, but I also don't need to be naive about it. I mean, the sort of the, the broader sort of forces in and the undermining of your work and the absence of resources and the hostile regulatory or legal environment, I completely get that. And I don't mean to sugarcoat it, but I do think that a central tenant of creative placemaking has to be community engagement. It just simply has to be funders and others, community leaders, recognizing that the process of engagement leads to the process of attachment and the process of ownership and the process of accountability. And at the end of the day, if the community can drive its own vision, can drive its own tools, and can drive its own aspirations over the long term, I think it, I, I, the, na the naive part of me thinks that that changes ultimately the politics, that really toxic politics can survive that only for so long. Because the power of that kind of community work just is sort of self-apparent. I mean, it, it gives people a sense of rootedness in place, it attaches people one to another, and it's an act of political organizing, even if it's not ostensibly an act of political organizing. I, but it's a really good question. And Maria, you probably have a better answer. No, I don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I, I fully agree that, that uh, when you have people who have invested 
physically, emotionally, and intellectually in creating the place that they call home, mm. that's strong. And it's really, it's powerful. And I, I, think, I think you're right. It is uh, essential to community organizing. It is essential to claiming power. Uh, and it's even essential to claiming power in the face of, of inequality. Uh, there, there is something about standing uh, in a place and feeling that it is part of who you are and what you're responsible for that will make you act in a different way and will make systems respond uh, in, in a different way. Can I just add, and this is a little bit unfair because the timeline is so long, but from Minnesota, uh, another example. Um, many years ago, something called Heart of the Beast Puppet and Mask Theater in, in one of the um, poorest of Minneapolis' neighborhoods um, organized a May Day parade, and it, they, they chose to organize it around issues of social justice on a very local level. Uh, um, uh, fair wage issues, community benefit agreements, a whole series of things. And uh, they were just vilified by bad politics. It was a, a particular low point in Minneapolis's kind of conservative politics. And, um, and Heart of the Beast chose to essentially organize all year round. I mean, they had a, a parade on one day, but all of the other 364 days of the year, they were training young people to do make puppets. They were um, doing issue forums. They were doing all of these things out of their theater. And when they showed up on the ground um, in the first year, they were sort of belittled and heckled, and there were probably, I don't know, 500 people. I think the last May Day Festival had 42,000 people marching in it. And it has fundamentally shifted over the years the sort of the attention that local politicians, city council members in Minneapolis, pay to sort of community-based issues. And it, I, I think of Heart of the Beast as a great example of just someone who stayed the course over the long term, kept their eye on the prize, and, and refused to be sort of sidelined by the toxic politics. Now, that's one anecdote and, you know, I don't mean to, again, sugarcoat it, but I, I think it can happen. I think, I think this community engagement, community organizing, community purpose is really powerful stuff in the right hands, and I think artists are often the right hands to hold it. So with that, we're out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't be sorry. But just uh, parting words. Let me tie it back maybe to, to Aaron and to Sphinx. Um, you know, my sense is that, I was, I was talking to Sandra, one of your board members, um, when I went to get coffee. And I was saying that when Rocco Landisman came a couple of years ago, um, Aaron brought a couple of his young people to perform at the DIA. And I remember she missed a couple notes and her rhythm was a little shaky because she was nervous and it was the most powerful unbelievable sort of statement of human development, human capacity, human aspiration, and there were a couple of these young people. And I think so much of what the arts do and what, what Sphinx does and what Aaron does is exactly what we're talking about. It sort of creates this sort of long-term pipeline in which we can think about self-identity, self-development, the capacity of people acting as individuals, the capacity of people acting in ensembles, the possibility of people acting in fields. And so I think that whether you're Sphinx or whether you're Mosaic or whether you're Heart of the Beast puppet theater, it seems to me that the kind of formative role that arts and culture workers have in our community is, is really a cause for enormous optimism in this time of very toxic politics. So thank you all for doing what you do. Thank you. So right now we want to give you a chance to take a break, stretch your legs, have some coffee, and process some of what you've heard so far. Uh, the speakers will all be in the conference room right next door, so we'll come back here in about 10 minutes.